Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 2020. Be prepared to be inspired. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. Guess what? Today I'm in, in the sunshine at the Revs Institute in Naples, Florida, with a very special guest by the name of Miles Collier. Miles, welcome to Cars Yeah. Do you have any gear, and are you ready to release the clutch? I think we are. Yes, yeah, something you're always ready to do. Well, I'm really excited to share this new book with our listeners today. So allow me to provide you with a proper introduction, and we'll dive right into this marvelous piece of uh, wordsmithing you've done. Miles C. Collier has spent a lifetime in cars. He's an ex-race car driver from a family of car lovers, and he has spent what he calls many grubby-fingered hours fixing and restoring historical automobiles, and thousands more driving a broad array of them. He is a firm advocate of the automobile as the most important technological artifact of the 20th century. I would agree. He is the founder of the Revs Institute, regarded as one of the greatest repositories of automobile resources in the world. It houses a collection of over 100 historical, exceptional automobiles and has an extensive archive as well. Miles believes in building lasting cultural legacies that can be used and interpreted to inform generations to come. The Archaeological Automobile, his new book devoted to doing just that. It's a legacy resource that assigns the car its rightful place in the cultural center of the contemporary world. We'll be back in just a moment to learn a lot more about this book, but first a word from our valued sponsor, so give them a little listen, and we'll be right back. My friends at Covercraft offer you 10 different options. That's right, 10 for your vehicle's protection. You can choose from WeatherShield HP, HD, Sunbrella, Ultratect, Reflect, FormFit, Custom View Shield and their newest five layer all climate cover, three layer moderate climate cover, and a five layer indoor option. You have all sorts of ways to protect your car. All of these are custom tailored by Covercraft's talented craftspeople. It's the form and fit with the quality to attention to detail that's been their standard since 1965. Surface protection is the best way to preserve the investment you've made in your vehicles. It's what I do. Covercraft protects cars, trucks, motorcycles, RVs, trailers, and watercraft too. I have a Covercraft cover for every one of my vehicles, and I've got a deal for you. If you use the code YEAH21, Y-E-A-H-21, at Covercraft.com, they'll give you 10% off your order, plus you get free shipping. That's right, 10% off and free shipping. Just use the code YEAH21 at checkout. Covercraft, protecting the things that move you. I was talking with a buddy of mine the other day, and he asked me about American Collectors Insurance. He said, while I listen to you on Cars Yeah, you're always talking about agreed value collector car insurance. Well, I insure all my cars on my regular auto insurance policy, and I've done it for years. Why use a different company for my collector cars? I get a multi-car discount. Isn't that good enough? I suggested he call his carrier and ask how much he would get if his collector car was totaled are stolen. He called back and said, boy, that was a scary conversation. Their value of my car wasn't even close to what it's really worth. Thank you for the education, Mark. So don't just hope for a fair claim settlement. Be certain and know exactly what you receive with an agreed value policy. American Collectors Insurance has been protecting enthusiasts since 1976. Give them a call today for your personal agreed value quote at 866-ACI-YEAH. That's 866 866- 224-9324. Tell them you're a friend of Mark Green's at Cars Yeah. American Collectors Insurance, classic car insurance, designed by collectors for collectors, automotive enthusiasts just like you and me. They're the ones that insure my car. That's American Collectors Insurance. So for those folks listening that don't know about you, Miles, or your extensive background with the automobile. Would you give us an overview of your involvement with automobiles over time and what led you to write this book at this point in your life, The Archaeological Automobile? Well, I'd preface uh, the question by saying it's all genetic. (laughs) My, My paternal grandmother was a car enthusiast back in the 1900s. 
my father and, and my uncle Sam were international sports car racers in the 1930s, competing at the Irish Tourist Trophy, Le Mans in France, and the Alpine Rally, to name just a couple. The latter in an Auburn V12 boat tail speedster that was sort of fearfully named Mephistopheles. Wow. And this was in addition to their ARCA racing in the United States. For myself, I was an SCCA racer in the 1960s and 70s, and then a vintage racer in the 80s and 90s. During college, I had a weekend and summer job as a foreign car mechanic, and I started collecting cars, specifically Porsches, in 1976. I started with a 904 and a Carrera Abarth GTL. Wow. I bought the Cunningham collection in 1986, opened the museum in Naples in 1990, developed the programming now for 20 years for an international symposium on collecting historical automobiles and founded REVS as an historical automobile research facility in the 2010s. This is incredible. What a history. Yes, you've got motor oil in your veins. <laughs> That's for sure. Let's talk before we get into the book. I'd love you to tell the listeners a little bit more about Revs Institute. I've known about it for many years. Wonderful facility. Uh, why did you start this and why the legacy of the automobile is, is so important? And we're going get, to get a lot deeper into that question as we go. But as it relates to the Revs Institute. The Revs Institute exists as a not-for-profit educational foundation focusing on advancing the mission of REVS, which is essentially to become a material conversationalist, let's think of it that way, in the global arena in four different areas. The first one is in the area of what we call praxis. What praxis is, it's care, use, uh, operating uh, rules and systems to deal with old cars to maximize their preservation and longevity and utility for the world as a legacy artifact. The second area that we feel that uh, we can contribute by being a conversationalist part of the discourse is in the field of connoisseurship. And connoisseurship, as no doubt everybody knows, is about uh, understanding that small differences in artifacts makes for large differences in historical, artistic, uh, even monetary value. It's about uh, you know, assisting in programmatic activities that lead to uh, assessing genuineness of, uh, of artifacts in understanding uh, their makeup and, and how they ought to be. And then there's the field of legacy. Legacy is about the historical significance of the of the automobile. We want to be one of the people, one of the organizations that makes a case for the automobile being among the most important technologic objects of the 20th century. Certainly after a wholesale distribution of electric power, there isn't much that's more important than the automobile. And we want to be instrumental in developing you know, that discourse about individual automobiles as representations of all that's great of the human mind and spirit and automobiles as a social and historical and economic force. And then finally, the field of society, which is basically where the arena of the old automobile comes in contact with the public. And by society, I'm not necessarily referring to the enthusiast, though they, they certainly are part of that. They're also part of legacy, part of connoisseurship. But the, basically the general member of the public who may have some awareness of automobiles, but has no idea about how significant they are, how important they are, and how the great automobiles are everything that's great in the human mind and spirit and worthy of respect and worthy of preservation. So that's basically the, the remit for Revs Institute. Is the Revs Institute a facility people can visit? Revs Institute can be visited as a facility for two reasons. First is, come see our collections. We're open Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays from 10 to 4. And we are also available as a resource for people who are uh, doing research, who are writing books, who are writing articles. We are here to support the whole universe, as it were, of historical automobiles 
with our archives, with our photographic archives, with all the materials that we have here. Uh, wonderful what you're doing here. Also, you have Collier Auto Media, which is a wonderful website, fun website to visit. It's a very enthusiastic focused media outlet that celebrates the automobile and history. And that's the place people can go to purchase this new book, right? Uh, yes, we, we you can purchase the new book through there. You can go directly to Amazon and purchase the book. And uh, according to our national book distributor you should also be able to find it in bookstores but if you want to make sure you can find it easily i'd either go to uh, collier auto media or i'd go to amazon there you go i'll put links to that on miles show notes page here on the cars yeah website for you listeners that are in motion right now and uh, should be having your eyes on the on the road ahead of you and the hands on the wheel uh, the archaeological automobile is it's your first book and it's what i would Describe as a guide to understanding, using, loving, and living with historical automobiles. Would you give us a, an overview of what readers can expect when they start turning the pages? And I'll tell you, uh, there's 390 pages to this book. It is in-depth. Yes, uh, it goes to show what you can accomplish if you let your uh, your thoughts uh, just run amok. <laughs> but, uh, so here's basically what the, what the book is about. I believe we owe a degree of respect to culturally transformative things that have managed to endure for years, decades, and now with respect to the automobile, in some cases, more than a century. And this book is about that respect, about the care, about reconnecting with the past through historical cars. And finally, the and this is key, the reconstruction of the past through those automobiles and the stories that can be read in their matter. The other uh, you know, key elements is that it's respect for the car as an individual, not necessarily as one of a homogeneous production run of industrialized products. And the idea is that as an artifact, in, in this case an automobile, accumulates mileage and years of use, gradually the effects of the humans that have come in contact with that car becomes manifest in the physical materiality of the automobile. We can read that. That's a very exciting thing. We can think of it as a document and we can read those marks of use, change, deterioration, modification, repurposing. And that tells us in a very intimate and very direct way, unlike reading a text of some kind, about what the people thought and did in the past. And I find that absolutely extraordinary. And that's the archaeological automobile. Wow. You put that very succinctly for a book that's as massive as this, which is fabulous. I would imagine there were some challenges you faced in putting this together. First of all, how long did it take you to write this book? It took me two years and a little bit to write the book. And I must confess, I wasn't as diligent as I could have been writing the book. But there's two ways to think about this. One is, how long did it take you sitting at a keyboard to crank the book out? And the other one is, how long did it take you to have the, the knowledge base and the ideas and the thoughts and, and indeed the determination that such a book would be valuable? And I can tell you that that took 60 years. Yes, a lifetime. I understand. I like to ask my guests about big challenges they faced. Uh, no doubt you've run up against a few in putting this book together. What were some of the biggest challenges in, in writing a book of this size and this in-depth? Well, certainly the biggest challenge in writing a comprehensive book that attempts to define a particular field, field of old cars in new ways, is just the simple issue of sequencing Oh. And then secondarily, the, the state of mind issue. So in sequencing, let, let, let's use a, a metaphor. It's possible to circle the globe starting anywhere. But there are some area, places that are better than others for doing this. And similarly, there are better places to attack a body of thought than others. And, and this is a non-trivial issue because what happens is as you get into one field, you realize that half the stuff you're writing requires prior knowledge. So then you want to back up to that, you know, that earlier state where the prior knowledge is, is helpful. And you realize that's dependent upon prior knowledge and so on ad infinitum. So ultimately, I chose starting with why we should care about old cars. And that is making the case for why we should care about old cars. So the first chapter 
is essentially one about the history of old cars, of, of, old, of cars in general, rather, and why that's, that changed our world. Then, you know, secondly, we went on to an overview of the world of collecting, sort of the, the anatomy of how cars are collected and what the issues are that drive concepts of value, collectability, use, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, then finally we get into the definition of the archaeological automobile, the, the concept about which the whole book is, is built. And that's this idea that, that human activity is impounded in the car itself and can be read. And that is, is absolutely a, uh, a transformative idea. And then ultimately collecting, restoring, and finally, you know, what is the archaeological car of the future? The other issue I had to deal with was the state of mind. And that is the need to write for both beginners and experts. I wanted this book to be something that everybody could use. A lot, a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so here's the way that deal works. The, the book was intended to grow with the reader's understanding. So as a beginning car person, you have certain questions and issues, and I try to track all those. And then as an intermediate collector, you have a wholly different set of issues, which I try to tackle. And at that point, you, you, there, there's intermediate level stuff in there that, that all of a sudden becomes germane and you, you start n noticing all of that. And then ultimately, uh, for, for people who have been at this for a long time and are experts and have their own view of the world, I hit you with some of the naughtiest, uh, you know, most complex issues about the epistemology of, of old cars and, you know, all, all kinds of big polysyllabic words, but which really gets to, you know, almost the metaphysical aspect of, of old cars. It's wonderful. With listening to everything you've said today, you definitely want to leave a legacy about the automobile. And I'd love to know from your perspective, what is that automotive legacy that you'd like to leave the world as it relates through this book? Well, ideally, I would like this book to become, I, I guess, what you'd call the standard text on the topic of not only old cars, but even the, the, the field of active matter. Now, active matter is, is something that I discuss in the book. And it's one of the things that's made for the largest difference in how we think about automobiles as archaeological objects and how we might think about a Greek amphora as an archaeological object. And what active matter is, it is that class of objects that until you experience their operation are wholly, cannot be fully apprehended, cannot be fully understood. And so we can imagine if you're the little proverbial little green man from Mars, seeing a car just sitting in a, in a museum gallery somewhere doesn't tell us much about what it, do, what it is, what it does, why people were using it, and so on. But once you experience the car by riding in it or preferably driving it, all of a sudden we understand this thing as a piece of active matter. And so the point is, there are a certain class of, of objects, musical instruments, that really are not understandable unless we understand the function. So a Cremonese violin in a glass case in a museum is just a piece of uh, antique wood with some cap gut on it. You have to hear it being played before you understand it. That's the story of what active matter in cars is. And I spend a lot of this book talking about the, the dual reality of cars. They are objects on the one hand. They are phenomenon, which means active matter. They accelerate, they slow down, they make noise, they do, they, they do all these other things. That is equally important in understanding cars. Absolutely. And I think uh, you and I and many enthusiasts share this concept that these vehicles are much more than museum pieces. They're best when they're used, when they're shared, when they're exhibited. You and I attend Concours events and racing events, and we both raced historic cars. Uh, they're best when they're in motion because that tells a bigger part of the story like you just described. It does. But here's, here's the kicker in the deal, right? There's always a fly in the ointment. <laughs> yes. Fly in the ointment is all use is consumption. Mm, okay. If you use the thing, even as carefully as you possibly can, with a sufficient amount of use and time, you're going to use the thing up and it's going to become a relic, a remnant. Something major will break. The originality of the object will ultimately uh, deteriorate over time. And the only way you can keep it going is by repairing it with replica parts. Because over a long enough period of time, all the original parts are going to go away, too, and you're going to be stuck with doing this with replicas. Right. So 
uh, it's life is not unalloyed joy of we restore the thing, it's good forever, and we can use it all we want. The, 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 the fact of the matter is, in a world of increasing entropy, everything, including us, including ourselves, uh, are headed uh, you know, for termination as a vestige, as dust. We all return to dust. Say it ain't so, Miles. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, in many ways, it's a very freeing concept. Yes. Okay. The, the idea, you know, is that uh, we have this fabulous car and, and uh, it, you know, it, it's up to us to keep it forever. And anything we do that could damage it is, is iniquitous. And, and we, we have committed a great crime against humanity by allowing this fabulous expression of the human mind and spirit to be damaged in some way. Well, no, it's freeing if you understand that thing is on the road to ruin no matter what you do. Hmm. So we just want to be we want to be conscious about that fact and we want to be sensitive to how we use it so that the game is worth the candle. The, using it on for this application at this time is reasonable given the longevity that I expect out of the car and the negative in, impact of what I'm about to do. So if you're a vintage racer, that's probably the most extreme example. You run the risk of wadding, of rolling that thing up into a ball every time you take it out. Yep. you got to decide whether the game's worth the candle. And so what it basically, what, what my book tries to say is that's situational. Mm. You have to understand the, the object that you're dealing with, the car that you are using. Is it unique? Is it so original that if anything happens to it, it is the last reference caliber object in the world? If that's the case, you probably don't want to go vintage racing with it. Yeah. On the other hand, if it's one of uh, 167 uh, examples from a particular year, and uh, there's lots of availability of them, I feel perfectly free to do whatever the hell you want. <laughs> so, and that's what I'm trying to tell people is be thoughtful. Understand what the issues are. Yeah. Jeez. You know, I, I need to sit on your uh, counselor's couch here because I'm going through that with a, a very original, unique car I have. And I tend to not want to go out and enjoy it because I'm so terrified somebody's going to T-bone me while they're talking on their phone in their uh, Escalade. Uh, but at the same time, I want to go enjoy this vehicle and share it with others. And it's a conundrum. Yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely a conundrum. And as I say, it's it's completely situational. And it's it's situational, not just objectively, but it's situational subjectively. In other words, yeah. yep. somebody else may have a virtually identical car and they don't worry about it at all. Or they worry about it so much that the thing is, you know, in a nitrogen filled case somewhere up on blocks, et cetera, et yeah. cetera. And it's, it's really up, up to you. And, and, and at the end of the day, my book says that it is up to the owners. And if you are thoughtful about what you do, the needs of society to preserve these great legacy artifacts will be adequately taken care of. Mm, wonderful. I don't believe in a command and control overview of these things where you've got some cultural board somewhere saying, you know, that's a really important car. You can't use it anymore. Yeah. 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 That, that, that's absurd. I, I believe that individual owners are, are the ultimate uh, decision makers for their objects. And if they're thoughtful, they'll make the right decisions. Absolutely. We'll take a short break for some sponsors here. We come back. I want to talk about a special vehicle in your life. This could be a tough question. So we'll be right back. You listeners know that I'm a huge car care fanatic and my friends at AutoGeek created their Wolfgang Deep Gloss Paint Sealant for perfectionists like you and me. Wolfgang a Deep Gloss Paint Sealant is designed to provide long-lasting protection and a glossy slick finish that, well, it's unmatched. The use of polymer technology ensures your paint is protected from environmental contaminants, those damaging UV rays, and lasts up to three months long. By providing the glossy look of carnauba wax with the longevity of a synthetic formula, Wolfgang a Deep Gloss Paint Sealant is the best of both worlds. Go to autogeek.net to get yours for the best product selection on the internet today, along with their skilled technical support. Autogeek.net is where I go for all my detailing needs. That's autogeek.net. The most important lesson I've learned is that we are at our best when we help others. Cars Yeah! is all about inspiring automotive enthusiasts and helping others to be successful. In 2022, my charities of choice are Tech Force Foundation and RPM Foundation. Both are groups of like-minded nonprofits working together to preserve and promote car culture across the country. RPM was created to ensure that the specialized skills needed to care for classic automobiles, boats, and motorcycles continue to be passed down 
from generation to generation. They do this by supporting training for young people with a passion for restoration and setting them up with mentors who can share their valuable knowledge. TechForce Foundation is dedicated to solving the technical shortage that threatens the transportation industry today by providing career development resources and increasing awareness and enthusiasm for the tech profession. Learn more about these groups at RPM Foundation and TechForce Foundation today. So, Miles, tell me about one, this could be a challenge for you, one very special vehicle in your life. I'd love for you to share a, a great memory or experience you had with that vehicle. And how does that vehicle relate to the theme of your book as it relates to the relationship between those of us who love cars and the cars? Well, that, that is a challenging question. Clearly, the 1919 Ballo Indy car, which is featured in, in my book, is an important artifact for me. But I won't discuss it here. It's fully presented in my book. And, you know, in truth, I have worked on, conserved, restored, and activated so many cars over my life that there, there probably isn't just one story. You know, 40 years of practice has caused me to develop many of my ideas and approaches to uh, the field. And I think, you know, as we were just saying, one of the most profound realization has, be, has been that all interventions, which is conservation and restoration, is fictional. It's a very important idea that the best we can produce when we do a restoration is a simulacrum or an ev evocation of a forever lost and unknowable reality. So when I take undertake an intervention of an old deteriorated car, and you know, one example might be, you know, in, in my book, I, I talk about uh, you know, the seven avenues of engagement. And one of the most important one is nostalgia, this idea of objects that relate us to, that help us relate to our own past. And I have a number of nostalgic cars in my collection, not the least of which was the first, uh, automobile I ever owned, which was given to me as a graduation gift from secondary schools, a 356C Porsche 1600 SC Coupe. And I, I have it to this day. And it's got 42,000 original miles on it. Oh, and my it gosh. Brand, it smells brand new. It drives brand new. And it's the repository of, you know, much and uh, many experiences in the world, it and me. And I, I mention it in passing in my book. And I mention, among other things, and I think this is, is worth observing, I, I talk about how it's, its life now is not necessarily as the archetypal museum exhibit sitting in a hushed gallery under dimmed lights with a, a photo mural of it in its heyday behind it and explanatory labels and so on. Rather, it's a car that, while it spends some time like that, also works for its living still by going on old car tours, you know, four-day old car tours around the country. Wonderful. And so, in, in many ways, the car is, a, is still active in the world, though not as transportation. It's now as basically an antiquarian object to supply me with experiences among other users of old cars in a convivial atmosphere. Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm experiencing the car through the lens of nostalgia and through the lens of perhaps connoisseurship in the sense that uh, no modern car has the kind of precise steering that one of these uh, old Porsches has or one of these old Alfa Romeos or something. I mean, they are razor sharp in their steering. If you can place the car within a quarter of an inch of where you want it, it's not. You can't do that with a modern car, which feels so technological under your fingertips. Right. But anyway, so so the point of of the story is that over those various four day tours, I've come to the conclusion that the car is relative to modern traffic so bloody slow <laughs> in its day. It was a more than sufficiently fast automobile. Right. Relative to today's traffic, it's it's not terribly quick. And so I think I comment in my book, you put the accelerator pedal to the floor and it makes more noise, but it doesn't go any faster. <laughs> yes. So how do we keep something like that alive in the world? And I'd say, well, as with all objects, objects get repurposed. I've repurposed this car a little bit 
so that it still looks exactly the way it always has. It's a remarkably original automobile. I've taken really good care of it over the years, but I've now fitted it with 160 horsepower, 1900 cc touring engine. It takes an hour to put the thing in place. You know, uh, if anyone who knows Porsches or Volkswagens, the, the motor is essentially held in by four bolts. Yep. <laughs> So the, the you know the thing can can be it has a reversible new engine in it and I put the new engine to go on tours and all of a sudden the thing now keeps up with traffic I don't worry about getting hit in the back by a tractor trailer or something and the car supplies me now with a, a degree of pleasure that it wouldn't otherwise have done so I'm I can ex- enjoy my nostalgic experience but at the same time I'm also enjoying it in the context of what I'm used to today. Hmm. And this is not an iniquitous thing. It's not iniquitous because one, the new engine is reversible. And secondarily, if we look at the life of objects, objects are redefined, they are redeveloped, they are reconsidered in their trajectory through, uh, through time. So this is keeping this car alive in the world. Now it's becoming a little bit more of a contemporary object because that's a contemporary kind of a thing to do to it. Right. But it's central to the active life of this car. And any time that I want to return it back to its pre-modified days, I just change engines. There you go. I love it. (laughs) Nice description. I want to go back to this title you chose, the Archaeological Automobile. How do you define archaeology as it relates to the automobile and what remains from the past to the present. You touched a little bit on on it with that description of that beautiful little Porsche that you have. But how, how did you come to define this title as it relates to past and present in the automobile? Archaeology is the science of things. It's the science of examining, cataloging, collecting, analyzing things from the past to infer things about people from the past. And archaeology is defined by small aspects of particularity, of individuality, and is therefore the ideal lens through which to examine old cars. Archaeology allows us to read the artifact through the archaeological mindset, which is this patient probing an interrogation of the object for clues about how it was used in the past. And what that does is that can surface prospective narratives because we get data from the object. It's the data has no connections to other bits of data. But if we start connecting the dots, we can we can hypothesize stories, narratives about how all of these things happen. And that begins to reveal a different past for this object than we were aware of. It may never have been recorded. And so the uh, narrative of the past becomes active in the present. I use some examples in my book of that about how an accident on a 917 that was never repaired in 1970 goes on uh, to tell us about the mindset of people back then because in those days it was okay to have a world-class world sports car championship car that had a bent chassis and not fix it well nobody today in this litigious world of ours would ever do something like that so it tells us something about the world yeah and and the the whole point of this is that archaeology is really the reactivation of memory Mm. That these things are, and one way to think about them, and this is a a little bit woo-woo, it's a little bit metaphysical, Mm -hmm. is that artifacts from the past are the tangible memories of bygone past itself. These are the actual dreams and memories of the past. And just like our dreams and memories, they come in little snippets, and they're not necessarily related to other little snippets. You, you just have a, you flash on something from the past in your in your daily life, or you have a dream about the past. And when you find a new artifact, that's a pa- that's a, a a dream or a snippet of memory from the past itself. And just as Freud invented the interpretation of dreams, so archaeologists invent 
the interpretation of objects. And I use the word invent because we can't ever know that we're right. I mean, occasionally you get really lucky and you, and you have a textual source that illuminates a piece of artifactual and archaeological data. And you see that they line up or you see that they don't line up. But by and large, we are creating narratives about the past. And that's why our, the automobile is an archaeological object. You know, this is something that's near and dear to my heart, and I know it is to yours. You lament the loss of craftsmen skilled in uh, antiquarian techniques uh, and, and point out their loss and our connection to the past is is being diminished these days. And, and we keep edging closer to the day when maybe there are people not left around that can care for these vehicles and keep them on the road or keep them looking the way they should. What can we do to stop this reverse of trend? What are some of the organizations and ways that you've thought this through that we can reverse this trend that seems to be uh, coming upon us rather quickly as uh, automobiles become uh, autonomous and electric and maybe are put out to pasture like the horse was? Those are good questions. The issue, I believe, does not lie necessarily in the large end of the funnel, which is where people are being gathered up and offered training to be able to work on historical automobiles. That's, that would be what RPM Foundation, what uh, McPherson College does, places like that where you basically get introductory and fundamental training and, and various skills to enable you to be a historical automobile professional in, in over the years. Where I think the real need is, is mid-career training. So what we're talking about are people who are already quite skilled in automotive restoration and working on old cars and understanding old cars as complex antiquarian uh, systems and so on, but now need to be brought up to the next level of competence in some of the more esoteric technologies that are out there that are literally uh, vanishing from the earth. For example, uh, low-tension magnetos and striker ignition. That was a type of ignition that only existed for, who knows, five to ten years. And it, it was one where, instead of using a spark plug, there actually is a rocker arm inside the cylinder head that generates a spark between the rocker and its uh, other electrode. And it all happens inside the cylinder. So you think of it as like a set of points, only these points are in the cylinder where the yeah. flame happens. Incredible. And it makes the car go. And that's called striker ignition. Well, you know, the number of people that are versed in dealing with a striker ignited car these days can be counted on the fingers of one hand. Yeah. Wow. And so my view is, and not necessarily to, to pick that example, but that just gives you a feel for just one area, is that what we need is uh, an organization somewhere that offers these kinds of workshops for mid-career technicians who want to increase their skill level. Or when maybe it's uh, brush painting with uh, linseed oil based and, uh, and coach varnish paints. Hmm. Now, most people don't want something like that because it's very fragile and it, and it wears quick. But, you know, as our field advances and gets more sophisticated, there is going to be a demand for more use of authentic materials on some cars, not necessarily ones that are going to be used a lot, but on some cars. And this all makes our field richer and more evocative of the realities of the past that we want to preserve. It's wonderful. You know, one of the key questions that I think a lot of readers of this book will pick up on is where does archaeology enter into the relationship between people and old cars? Archaeology works as the mediating vehicle between people in the past, in this case, old cars. Archaeology is this idea of the particularity of an individual automobile that if properly read through the archaeological mindset, and if the archaeological imagination is applied to it, that is, the archaeological imagination takes archaeological data points derived from the archaeological mindset and constructs 
narratives around it, that if, if all of that happens, uh, we learn surprising things. And in chapter three of my book, where I introduce the concept of the archaeological automobile, we talk about the 1919 Indianapolis Bellow and essentially illustrate three narratives that were heretofore largely unknown through the normal techniques of history, which is basically the technique of reading texts, reading music, reading newspaper articles about what happened in the day and so on. And in this case, there's at least two critical stories that never appeared in any newspaper anywhere, but that can be established with high degree of assurance through archaeological techniques of looking at historical archaeological photographs and understanding how the ballot operates from first principles. And so we've, we've come up with, with a number of radical new stories that literally have changed the history of the ballot car in 1919. And that's consequential because the ballot of 1919 is arguably one of the most important high technology cars of all time. Marvelous. You know, all cars, after hearing so much of what you said today, are really archaeological. If their owners think that way, how can we help younger generations pick up the, uh, as we call the proverbial torch, and keep the spirit and meaning of automobiles alive going forward? Well, you're absolutely correct in understanding that all cars are archaeological cars if you want them to be. It's strictly in, in, the archaeological car is created in the mind of the person beholding the car. The point of helping future generations to stay involved with automobiles is one that I think if we think that we're going to dictate that to future generations, we're already starting off on the wrong foot. I think that because automobiles are labile and, and changeable and Re, and can be reinvented the way that the next generation views automobiles and wants to engage with automobiles is something that, that we need to let them discover and we need to encourage them uh, towards because it's by that redefinition of old cars that the, that the old car finds a new life. Mm. So what I'm saying is, you know, old cars qua old cars are not some kind of sacred object that has to be preserved in aspect. Now, there don't get me wrong. There are certain historically significant cars in remarkably original condition that only a clod would ever mess with. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> they speak for themselves. Okay, we, we've got a W one five four Mercedes Grand Prix car from nineteen thirty nine here. Uh, you know, anybody that, that does anything other than try and take care of its physical material makeup, it's it's the physical matter that makes that car would be nuts. All right. So that's not what I'm talking about, but I am talking about the evolution of in general, old fun cars that, that people in, enjoy doing something with that become a, a modality for people to explore the material world and explore the material world on their own uh, principles and inclinations. And if we can do that, we will create the next generation of individuals, of people who respect and honor and care about automobiles. The, the, the biggest issue that we face in the world today is this growing dichotomy. And I, let me get off base here, but I think it's really critical to the archaeological automobile, is this growing dichotomy between people who are knowledge workers, who are information workers, who deal in the information digital space and people who deal in the real material world. Mm. And that that chasm is getting greater and greater and it's leading to all kinds of social unrest and other problems. And my view is something as seductive as an old car can do more to bridge that gap, to introduce people to the fascination and the demands and the constraints of the material world, which informs your thinking, uh, you know, about a whole whole aspects of, of our current lives, uh, that it would really be a, a you know a positive boon. 
And so we really want to encourage the use of the old car in all of its manifest ways, in hobby ways, in connoisseurship ways, in curatorial ways that uh, the next generation can employ to you know, better understand the world in which they live and to experience the world in which they live. Complex idea, but there you go. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, brilliant. Well, before I let you go, because we could talk for hours, but what I really want is for our listeners to get their hands on this book. And for you listeners out there that love automobiles and books and history, this is a must have for your uh, library collection. Uh, I've got one here. It's uh, it's brilliant. I love it. Before I let you go today, Miles, could you share maybe some words of wisdom, inspiration for listeners, a mantra, some type of thing that has great meaning for you that would be inspirational for others who love the automobile like you and I do? Well, I mean, you know, there's a couple of you know, wise guy comments that I could make, uh, <laughs> you know, such, such as... Uh, you can never go wrong over intellectualizing something. Okay. <laughs> and of course, we know you can absolutely go wrong. Oh, yeah. Intellectualizing things. So, so, you know, that, that's not really the issue. I think it's, it's this, that if you uh, engage with some subject and you think about it over a long period of time and try and think about it deeply, you will be utterly uh, stunned at the ideas that you develop and where you come out. So, you know, the biggest surprise to me in writing my book was what I thought about a whole bunch of different things. I went into the book thinking one way and I came out of the book thinking another way. And that came from trying to articulate a point and work through the arguments. And all of a sudden, I find that my thoughts about something that were pretty rigid one way changed completely. And now I think completely the opposite. And that's one of the reasons why one writes books. You write books for two reasons, really. One uh, is to tell people about these great insights you have. And the other one is you write a book to find out what you think about something. Mm, yes. <laughs> and I wrote the damn book to think about it, to see what I thought about something. And I've been very, very surprised. So I encourage people to uh, give that a go. You don't have to write a book. Just, just think about stuff for a while. Right. Ah, it's brilliant. I love it. What, again, are the many ways people can get their hands on this great book? Amazon, or there's a uh, a link in Collier Auto Media. You might want to go to that. Yep. Check that out. Uh, or uh, you should ultimately be able to get them at your local bookstore. You know, if, if you want to make this uh, as simple as possible for yourself, so I would, I would say Collier Auto Media or Amazon. And I would encourage you listeners, if you've not been to the Call Your Auto Media website, callyourautomedia.com, you should go. It's a great place to visit. There's all sorts of great things to see. And of course, you can get your hands on this book. And again, I'll put links to all these on Miles' show notes page so you can go review everything we talked about today. But I would encourage you to get your hands on this book. And you know what? This would be an incredible gift for your automotive buddies and uh, guys or gals, whoever loves automobiles. Uh, this would make a great gift gift. Uh, I think I'm going to get my hands on a bunch of these and give these away uh, to some of my best friends here. Miles, hey, thank you for being so generous today with your time and your expertise. And more so, thank you for writing this very important book. It's absolutely wonderful. This has been really a treat for me to get to talk to you. Until you and I talk again, no doubt I'll see you down the road. Thank you so much, Mark. I look forward to seeing you down the road as well. Great fun. I've discovered Linkage. It's a new quarterly publication and website that covers the automotive market, driving, restoring, collecting, and discovering your passion for motor vehicles. Linkage is about experiences, opinions, and values. Linkage is an actual, informed, reasoned opinion based on firsthand experiences. A talented Linkage team covers the automotive world the people who share your passion and mine, smart, considered, rational, and experienced opinions, ones you can learn from and grow. That includes our passion that drives auctions and the collector car market. So come with me and join us on this journey. And be sure to use the code CARS YEAH when you subscribe, and they'll give you $10 off. Boom! Linkage, geared for the automotive life. Subscribe today at LinkageMag.com. 
Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.